Okay, you can open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We're going to get over there in just a few moments and read from the text there. We're going to be talking now about the widow and her two mites. This is not someone that really had an interaction with Jesus, but it's someone that Jesus noticed. And so we can learn from her the type of things that Jesus notices in people. Uh, and he does that on occasion. He points out different people that have done different things and says, you know, take, take a look at this. This is a good example here. And this is one of the cases where Jesus does that. So I really appreciate uh, this story and the woman and her heart. And I think all of us will be able to gain something from taking a look at her. Um, I mentioned before that our family had an opportunity to live in Jerusalem. We lived there for almost a year, which was fantastic. But also since that time, I've been able to go back a number of times, probably a, a dozen or more, and help lead tour groups uh, to the Holy Land. And it's one of my favorite things to do. It's, it's just amazing being able, being able to you know, literally walk where Jesus walked uh, and see the stories from Jesus and from his time on the earth. Uh, and one of the things that people love to do when they're in the Holy Land is they, um, they love to bring back a specific souvenir that reminds them of being there. And uh, for many people, that is the, the widow's mite. The widow's mite is pictured here, um, right behind me. On one side, you have an anchor, and on the other side, you have um, a wheel. I actually brought one with me today, and I wish I could pass it around and everybody see it. But anyway, if you want to see it afterwards, I have it up here. Uh, it does have an anchor on one side and it has a little bit of a wheel that you can distinguish on the other side. Um, but it's just a small, a small little coin. And it's actually, well, at that point in time, it was the smallest minted coin uh, in the Holy Land. And so it wasn't worth very much at all. We would think of it as a penny or even less than a penny. And so um, it wasn't very valuable then. They're honestly not that expensive even today to buy one and to have it as a, a souvenir uh, because there were so many of them that were minted that every time, basically there's a rainy season in, um, and around Jerusalem and it comes in the spring of the year. And as the rain uh, comes down in the gutters, um, you'll find little children looking for these coins right here and the coins just run out of the ground and on into the the gutters and they pick them up and then they go sell them uh, sometimes by the sack pool um, they'll be able to, to find them but uh so what she had wasn't worth very much but uh it was something that today people hold it on to why because of because of this woman's legacy really they don't want the widow might because it has great value and they're gonna collect it like a coin collector and you know sell it some point down the line. It contains value simply because of the symbol of this woman being willing to give her all to Jesus. And so that's why we look at this story today and there's great insight that we can gain from this uh, widow. I mentioned today, we'll be talking about two widows, two anointings and a person outside of Israel, a, a foreign woman. And so this is the second widow. Uh, the, everything that I said about uh, with the first widow, Anna, applies here as well. Uh, this is a person who would have been on the outside of society trying to look in. It is a person who would have been fending for her life without any social security system or anything like that. And it is a woman who at, the, at, at one point in her life has to make a decision and she has two coins, whether to give zero or to give 50%, or to give it all, and she gives it all. And it's a tremendous, tremendous example for us. So, Mark chapter 12, you guys with me? Yeah. Okay, verse 41. As Jesus sat opposite the treasury, he saw how the people cast money into the contribution box. Many rich people put in great amounts. A poor widow arrived and put in two small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. This passage is sometimes used to talk about contribution, but really that's not the point of the passage. Jesus isn't talking about contribution here. 
Uh, we ought to contribute to the church, and we ought to contribute regularly. Um, that is taught in the New Testament. Sometimes that contribution is called tithing. Uh, however, tithing is not taught, not in the New Testament. It's taught in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. A contribution is good, contribution is right, but I don't believe that's what this story um, pertains to. This story has pertains more towards discipleship and about giving your whole heart to God and about uh, being wholehearted for the Lord. It has more to do with that. Um, to give your tithe is only giving 10% of what you have. And that's nothing like what this woman did. And that's why it doesn't really apply to that. What this woman did was she was not giving her tithe. She was giving her whole self to the Lord. Um, and so that's, that's part of the power and the beauty of the story. It's a very simple story. It's very easy to follow. Jesus sits down, and I know it's kind of hard to picture, but you can picture the, the temple being built on a high rise that basically is the size of a football field or more. And so up on top of the temple mount, there's just this huge expanse of, of land there. Uh, and in the middle of it is the temple, the, the, the temple built to God. But then on the outside of it, there's Solomon's Colonnade on one part. Uh, there are, are, are platforms. There's the outer court for the women. There's the inner court for the, the men. There's the court beyond that for the priesthood. Um, and so there's there's different sections. And then the, in one, one corner, and, and, uh, and part of it also, they in that day and time, they shouldn't have had it, but they had people exchanging money and buying and exchanging money and people turning the temple into a house of commerce instead of a house of prayer. And of course, Jesus cleanses the temple uh, for that. But in one corner, there was a place where people would give to the temple treasury. And this was a free will offering to the temple treasury. Uh, Jesus sat down opposite that and was just looking. And I, I know one of the things I love to do in life is just people watch, you know, just watch what's going on around. Um, I mean, I mean, like in Times Square, you know, you go to Times Square and you just see the whole world just walk in front of you. And it's an endless sea of humanity. It's amazing. There's streams and streams of people never ending. And you can just see everything in the world going on there. And it must have been much, much like that on the Temple Mount, of just all the people that were there to see the temple, this wonder of the ancient world. Um, some of them there to worship. Some of them there out of tradition, um, but uh, people on top of people. And so Jesus just sat down opposite the temple treasury and he took notice. He looked. And the temple treasury itself, how it was built, um, it's hard to see in this little picture right here. But you see right behind, the man there, she's behind, there, right in front of him is like a, a siphon. It's like a, a brass or a copper a siphon. A tubing and so it goes down in the column and then it opens up into a box and that's where the coins fall into and um, it was coinage back then it wasn't dollar bills it wasn't paper currency it was coinage and so as you drop money into this brass uh, you know it's like the bell of a trumpet uh, as you drop money into it you're gonna hear the clanging and you're gonna hear all the the, the pinging and ponging and the jingling and the jangling of coins falling in. And so just by sit, sitting and observing, you could kind of tell uh, who's dropping in a lot and who's not dropping in a lot, you know? And you could kind of, you get to kind of listen and you could tell that. And, and um, you know, the stories are that uh, some people made extravagant show of what they were getting. And they would just drop in these large coins that would make the, the real loud uh, ring, you know, and you would know this guy's dropping in some change here. This is, a, this is amazing uh, what this guy is giving. Um, and then there are other times where you just hear just a little ping. And that's what you would get if you dropped in a copper mic. You would just get a little ping uh, on the side of this bell. And Jesus was just watching, just taking note of that. And I know, I mean, just thinking of human nature, I would imagine that for a lot of us, a lot of us would be, uh, and I know I would be thinking this, I'd be looking for the people that were dropping in a lot of coinage, you know, and listening to the pings and the, the pongs and the jingle and the jangle as it went down and rolled down through that bell 
of the people that were giving a lot. But Jesus doesn't make mention of that. Instead, Jesus notices someone else. He notices a poor widow, and he notices that she drops in two coins, and he has a sense that that's all she had to live on, those two coins. And he makes an example out of her. And I wonder, you know, th th those of us that are looking out, would we see that? Would we see those who are less fortunate, those who don't have as much? That's, that's what caught the eye of Jesus, because that's who Jesus was. So here's this widow who doesn't have very much at all, and she gives everything that she has. It shows the eye of Jesus to look out and to notice this poor widow. And then in verses 43 and 44, the story continues. Jesus called his apprentices to him and said to them, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has contributed more than everyone who put money in the temple, in the treasury. All of them gave out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything she had. She gave the entirety of her life. And it's, that's my translation, so it's hard to follow. That's the reason why. But I, I like the way that it, it does read it in the Greek. She gave the entirety, not just the whole, the entirety of her life. Mm -hmm. That's what she put in. And that's why she gets commended, and that's why Jesus takes notice of her. You know, the fact is, she could have walked on by and not given anything. And who would fault her? I mean, she had two little copper coins to live on. Uh, so she could have thought, well, giving, that's for the wealthy. I'm not going to give anything. Or she could have given 50%, which is a lot. And you got two coins to live on. She could have given half of it. And um, I'm sure a lot of people would notice that and commend her for that, you know. But Jesus notices her because she didn't give half she gave her all, the entirety that she had to live on. Half would have been incredibly generous, but she didn't stop with half. Her devotion didn't go halfway. Her devotion went all the way. And then the question that comes up, um, okay, what did she do after that? After you give everything that you have, what do you do next? She trusted. That's what she had next. When you, and that's really true of all of us. When we're talking about money, or we're talking about talent, or we're talking about time, we're talking about our whole heart and devotion. When you surrender to God, what do you do next? You have to trust. You have to trust that he's gonna lead and he knows better than we do. And we learn to trust. So I'm gonna call up a, a sister now who's going to share with us and I uh, really appreciate the sister sharing um, when I don't know her as well as honest as obviously I know Chelsea but um, <laughs> I know Chelsea pretty well um, but the thing that I that I see about this sister and, and she serves in the ministry she's right now she served in the ministry in the campus ministry in Brooklyn up until recently now she's serving in the ministry in Harlem um, and I'll just mention it's Hannah. Hannah yeah. so, Hannah's going to share for us next. Well, the thing that I notice about Hannah, just watching her from a distance, is she exemplifies a calm and gentle spirit. And I notice her joy, and I notice her happiness, and I also notice that she's just a team player who wants to serve God and do whatever she can do to help the kingdom. And that's that's where her heart is. And um, she has sat through many of my classes and I've always loved teaching her because what, honestly one of my favorite things in life is teaching uh, the younger people and the interns. But when she's in class, she's so diligent and ready to learn. And um, I just want you to know, sister, I really appreciate your heart and I appreciate your spirit and that um, you really exude the love of God uh, in your life. And I noticed that about you when I watch you in the fellowship. So I'm looking forward to hearing you share now. Let's all give it up for Hannah. Thank you, Pastor Jeff.
was feeling, right? <laughs> no, thank you so much, Steve, um, just for your teaching and just your heart. You know, I can always see your heart when you want us to learn something about God and Jesus, especially through the scriptures. Um, so like Steve said, my name is Hannah. Um, I became a disciple in the teen ministry when I was 16 years old. Um, I grew up going to our church in Queens. Um, my parents became disciples there when I was around five or six. And I dated my husband, Stephen, pretty much all throughout college. And then when we got engaged, we, um, and we got, when we both graduated, we got engaged, and then we got married within two months, and then we decided to go into the full-time ministry. So it's been six years that we've been married and in the full-time ministry together. And like Steve said, I'm in Harlem now, and we're like loving it over there. Um, we also have two little boys, Lucas and Levi, ages three and one. So my life is really full right now. <laughs> um, it is really amazing to hear about Jesus and women in the scriptures. You know, I find it so comforting that God really cares about women. God has plans for women, and God uses women as great examples. And I love how Jesus, like Steve said, takes notice of women, especially during a time when women were not seen as much of anything. I love the story of the widow and her two mites because Jesus notices her, her sacrifice, and her love for God. Every time I read this passage, I am challenged in my giving all around, not just financially, but in every area of my life. This widow also reminds me a lot of my own mother. You know, it makes the story of the widow so much more real to me because I got to see a similar sacrifice and conviction in my mom growing up. My mom lost her husband and became a widow with four children, me being the eldest when I was 13 years old. So I lost my dad right before I was entering high school and my life was turned upside down. And then I think back and only can think, wow, what about my mom's life? You know, I didn't even realize this till later on, really, my mom's perspective and what she had to go through. And I don't think I'll ever fully grasp all of that, but I got to understand more when I became a mother of just one child. You know, and I thought of my mom and my mom having four children, losing her husband, but she still stayed faithful to God. Amen. I saw my mom stay close to God, no matter what her circumstance was. I saw her reading the Bible in the kitchen, you know, asking me to pray with her in the car, even when I didn't want to. I saw her sharing her faith everywhere she went, you know, in drive throughs of McDonald's when we were hungry, you know, I'm like, mom, let's just go, you know? Um, I saw my mom picking up people and taking them to church on Sunday morning, you know, with four kids in the back of her minivan. You know, it's like, couldn't someone else have done this? You know, but she's like, no, she wanted to continue to help others get to know God. I saw my mom come off of work at 7 a.m. because she was a night shift nurse and jump into Bible studies with women, not even sleeping, you know? And I saw her sacrifice her time, her sleep, her money because of her love for God. And my mom could have made so many excuses you know, or even have the right reasons to say no to things, mm -hmm. you know, to not give in a certain way because she has four kids or has to take care of stuff or work, you know, there's so many legitimate reasons that she could have had. And I just saw her live out Christianity. You know, through this all, my mom is not perfect. We had a really rough relationship, but what I saw was that she didn't give up and that she didn't let anything stop her from showing God her love. And this widow, like Steve said, had options to not give anything and to give some or to give all, and she chose to give all. And I think about all the real reasons this widow could have said no, not to give everything she had to live on. And to me, I think of all the reasons I could have made, you know, like for one, I, I gotta eat, you know? and. Two, I definitely have to eat, you know? <laughs> that would have been my thinking, you know? And it would have been totally reasonable and wise today for her to not give everything. Um, so she could take care of herself, maybe perhaps her family. I don't know if she had children, you know? But she did trust in God, and she chose to give to God in this way, and Jesus saw this, and he pointed it out to his disciples and he saw her giving and her love for him. And, you know, I think about sometimes how I should give and how my attitude should be. 
And sometimes I can rationalize my giving or even tell myself, oh, well, I've given enough. I've done enough, you know, I've, I've served enough. I've shared my faith enough. I've loved enough, you know, and I deserve to rest or zone out or watch Netflix or even reward myself with something because I've already done so much. And this is not the attitude of Jesus. And it's not the attitude that Jesus wants to see in me. And this widow humbles me because she did not have this attitude. And the heart of this widow really shows me that I have to continue to give my all to God. When I go back and I look at first when I studied the Bible and I learned about Jesus and what it means to be a Christian. You know, the Bible taught me to go anywhere, to do anything for God and to give up everything for him. Because if I don't, I cannot be his disciple. And that still remains true today. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to remember to not lose this, to not lose this heart, this mindset, because then I won't be living out Jesus. I'll be living out Hannah's way and Hannah's feelings and Hannah's opinions. And that's not God's. Mm -hmm. And I have to be careful to really watch my life and my doctrine closely. I can fall into the messed up thinking that I did this when I was in college. You know, I served in so many ways in the church before, or I served the poor so many times with hope every year, or every time it's Martin Luther King's Day, you know, we go and we do something, right? And I could think, oh, well, I'm good now. And I think what seeps into our ch church culture is that we can do all these things when we're young, you know, yeah. or when you're new to the faith, or when you're in the campus ministry. But this is a lie from Satan. You know, yeah. college is only four to maybe six years for some of us. And, you know, you still, you still have to serve God, you know? Even when you graduate, even when you're single, even if you're dating or not dating, when you're married, if you become a widow, you know, no matter what you may face, I believe that because I have been a Christian longer, that my attitude and my love for God then only should be greater now than when I first began my walk with God. I don't want to look back at when I was a teenager and say, oh, that's when I had zeal for God, or that's when I was started up in the beginning. No, I really want to continue to grow and to not become complacent. And as every year passes, I want to see that growth and change within me. I want God to look down upon me and see that I am trying to please him in every single way possible, in every way that I can. You know, this though does look different now that I'm a wife and especially now a mom of two little kids because, you know, schedules change, life changes, status change, you know, whatever may happen. But I see that God still needs to be my number one, even in these areas, in these times in my life, these stages in my life, yeah. because the stage won't last forever. Right. And nobody and nothing else can take his place in my life. So even though I'm a mother now, that doesn't mean I'm exempt from having this type of heart and still having to resemble this example and do the things that the Bible calls me to do daily. I have to take away the excuses that come up in my life every day whether it may be as simple as, I'm just too tired today. Or, well, I had to think, well, Jesus was tired, especially going to the cross, and he didn't quit. And I have to keep going and do what I need to do, which is to love God and to love others. I have to tell myself of these things and remind myself of certain scriptures and hold on to Jesus through this. You know, the widow gave despite what others may have thought of her giving. She might have felt like she was worth not anything, giving her two mites, especially next to all these other people, maybe giving the large amounts. Like Steve talked about, like hearing all those sounds coming down. Imagine her coming and just dropping her two little, her two little mites. You know, and what I love about this, that it also shows that God isn't about large amounts of you know number or sums you know that's not like what he's about and i was taught to give even when i didn't have much you know when i was younger i didn't have a job but my mom gave me allowance yay i got allowance you know and so i learned how to give from the allowance that my mom gave me every week and so that when god blessed me with more 
I was able to give more, you know? And we can't wait to give when, the, when it's the right situation or the right outcome or, okay, this looks like it's gonna add up, so now I can give because I'll be okay, you know? And that's what I learned that we have to, I have to train my heart to give even when I don't have much, you know? So that when, does, when God does bless me with a lot, I'll still have the heart to give even more with what he's given me. And I see from this widow that I have no excuse. And that no matter how difficult the situation I may be in, I give because of my love for God. Yes. God sees my heart and my actions and how I give to him in all the different ways the Bible, gives, the Bible calls us to give. I have to remember that I'm doing this for him and not for people. Yeah. And this widow gave to God and not to be seen, but it's amazing that Jesus did see her. Yeah. And Jesus pointed her out. And God sees me. He sees me when I give, when no one else may see me. Right. And I find this to be so special, that nothing that I'm doing is going to waste. Yeah. And he sees my sacrifice, even when no one else may. Yeah. I'm not here, you know, to give so that people can praise me. And I'm not giving to be seen, but I'm giving because I love God. And I'm here to show him my love in every area of my life. And I pray that we can all do this and give and continue to give in this way. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for your willingness to share uh, with us. And I really feel like that the Holy Spirit led you to that scripture because um, that scripture was perfect for you to share about. And thankful that you shared about your, your mom and just um, her life uh, and so that we could learn from that. But also just your own personal sharing about your own life. It's been fantastic. And it does tie us right into the scripture that we're, we're looking at here. Because the, the question I want to ask, um, based on the widow and her two mites, is what, what is your spiritual legacy going to be? What will your spiritual legacy be? And when we think about the women that we've looked at so far, um, Anna has a spiritual legacy. When you think of the name Anna and you think about what she did and the way that she was waiting and... Um, had this attitude of worship night and day, looking for the Redeemer of Israel and then proclaiming him when she saw him. That's her spiritual legacy. It just lives on beyond her. When we think about the woman who anointed Jesus with perfume, that's a legacy there that lives on past her, her noticing Jesus, being willing to step into that uncomfortable situation to anoint Jesus, to show who Jesus was, um, it's a great legacy. And then of course the widow here with her, her two mites, it's a, it's, Jesus is the one who points her out. She doesn't point herself out, Jesus points her out and makes an example of her because in her giving her all, that was her spiritual legacy there. And she lives on in time because of that. And for all of us, we should be thinking about, well, what will our spiritual legacy be? Because the fact is, we will all have some spiritual legacy um, when we're gone. And we need to, the, the, the legacy that we are going to have is going to be built right now in the decisions that we make every day. Um, your life is basically a sum of your daily decisions. And so deciding every day that you're going to put both mites in, that you're going to be wholehearted that you're going to be fully devoted to God. And then that becomes your spiritual legacy because you've made that decision every day. I think another interesting question to ask here is, what will the spiritual legacy of our churches be? Because churches also have a spiritual legacy. When I say church in Jerusalem, you think a certain thing about the church in Jerusalem. When I mention the church in Laodicea, you probably think something when you hear about the church in Laodicea because they both have legacies. And when you look at your region of the church and you look at um, the church that you're a part of, what will the legacy be for that church? What will the legacy be for the New York 
ministry church in central Jersey with us? What will their legacy be? But also regionally, what will our legacy be? What will be we be known for? I was talking to a good friend of mine. His name is Greg Moretzky. He lives, he, he lives in California. He leads the ministry in the Antelope Valley Church, which apparently is north of, of L.A. I've not been there yet, but um, that's, that's where he's located, in the Antelope Valley. I don't know if they have any antelope there or not, but, um, yeah, how is it? Yeah, so, anyway, um, Greg was telling me about their little ministry that they have. I say, little, it's probably about 300 people, but it was around Christmas time. It was toward the end of the year, and somebody came into their service one day, somebody from the community, and said, we want to, we would like to give you a little honor and it was very unannounced and uh greg said well yeah okay um what what you got for us <laughs> <laughs> he said well we've done a, a survey of um people that live in this community that you're in and we want to give you the honor that the survey came back that you are the um the church that serves the community more than any other church. They not put their name in on the survey list. They not, you know, dropped into the box here. Um, I vote for them. This was something done totally at random, totally outside of anything that they did as a church. It was just somebody in the community there um, on the, the community board did this every year and they were distinguished as being the church that serves the most in their community. And I thought, wow, what a great legacy. Yeah. And it's not like that they were going for that. Hey, next year, let's shoot for an even bigger goal, you know? <laughs> so yeah, let's go for all of California next. No, they were, just, they were just serving. They were just doing what Jesus did and what Jesus would do, helping people. And I think what a great legacy that they were known, but they were, that was noticed about them. What is your church noticed for? What, did, what will the legacy be of your church? What will we be known for as individuals? What will we, need, we be known for as a church? Um, you know, I, I like the story of the widow because it, it shows me that we do have a spiritual legacy and it is about giving our all to God. And uh, I think a lot about legacy these days because, um, I mean, I don't know how many of you know it, some of you probably do, but back in at the end of July, I, I suffered a stroke. Um, thankfully, it was a mild stroke. Um, but when something like that happens in your life, it just makes you look at life. Where, where you've come from, where you are now, where you're going, all of it. It makes you just look at all of it. And so I was brought up with that reality that, you know, Steve, you need to take a real look at, at what you're doing with life right now. And where, where are you in life? You know, I woke up that morning and just to share a little bit of what happened. I woke up that morning and, um, you know, Lee and I were talking and Lee said, you know, I, I think you're slurring your words. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> And she said, no, Steve, I think you're slurring your word. I'm just dehydrated, you know? I, it, it'll go away. And I really, I couldn't hear it myself. Um, but uh, I should have listened. I should have listened to her at that point. But we, you know, I decided to go on with our day. And the next thing we were going to do is go see a house. And so we were, we were looking at houses. We went and saw a house. And we went to this house that... Um, uh, had these stairs and so I was actually drove to the house uh, went up and down stairs um, at one point the alarm in the house came on um, and so I got up on the top of a ladder to try to knock the alarm off that didn't work and so I took out my iPhone with a flashlight and went down in the dark basement with just this flashlight and there was water on the floor and I was flipping around for the switch to turn off <laughs> the light. And I was doing all of this having suffered a stroke through the night, um, but I didn't know. So anyway, I drove, drove back home and as, as I was driving home, I totally, I said, Lee, you're, I think you're right, I don't feel good. 
I think we should go see the doctor. And fortunately, we have a doctor who's a disciple, Dr. Marcus Williams, and uh, we can call him. And so I said, yeah, I'll call him. I'm sure he'll send me to the hospital or want me to come straight to him. So can we just stop by the apartment and eat first? <laughs> and I'm like, Hannah, I know what I would do too with that money. I would eat. Yeah. And that's the second thing I would do. I would eat. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so I was like, yeah, and we had this this beautiful uh, bacon cheeseburger that, that was yeah left over from the night before and with some french fries, and so I polished off that baby, and uh, I don't think I've had one since. Um, but uh, we called it Marcus, and sure enough, Marcus didn't say come to the. Um, the office, he said, go straight to the emergency room. Go straight to the emergency room and you do not drive. Okay, Lee drives. And so Lee drove me to the emergency room. He said, I'll call ahead. And I got to the emergency room and I, you know, I walked up to the desk and um, she said, yes, can I help you? And I said, well, my name's Steve Kennard. I, I think I need to see a doctor. And she said, well, what are your symptoms? I said, well, I have slurred speech and my right side is weak. And she, she and the, the nurse that was sitting next to her, both of them looked up and then they looked out and they said, wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, before I could blink, there was a wheelchair coming up underneath me. Uh, and they didn't check me in or anything. They just took me right in the back and started doing all of these uh, tests and that sort of thing. Um, Thankfully, it was a mild stroke, and uh, thankfully also because of um, something known as neuroplasticity, um, you're, because when you have a stroke, it actually kills off um, some nerves, but nerves can often work their way around that. So by the second day, I, I was actually uh, recovering my speech. The weakness of my right, right side was going away, um, and I don't have any lingering effects from that, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, they did run tests. Well, yeah, you know. they did run tests, and um, they because they wanted to find the cause, but they not found the cause, which happens in about 30% of stroke victims. Um, but they had a hunch that it might be something to do with my heart, and so just under my skin, right here, they put a little monitor that monitors my heart all day long, and then when I go to bed at night, it actually. Uh, it downloads into this little monitor and then uploads into a doctor's office and so it's checked every day um, which is um, a pretty cool technology you know uh, but I also had this reminder and I can touch it right here it's just right there right underneath my skin and if I move my my muscles then I can feel it um, or just move my skin and if I don't have muscles there what? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I knew that Don was thinking that, so I thought, why not just go ahead and say it? Since Don is here and Don is thinking. Uh, but anyway, I, I could, I, it's right there, and it's right there all the time. And um, it reminds me, it reminds me that I live in a new normal. There's a new normal in my life that has to do with I take medication every day. I need to watch my diet, I need to exercise. My neurologist said, I don't want to give you any pills, my cardiologist did. I give you any medication, the only thing that I'm prescribing for you is you walk or ride 30 minutes a day. That's my prescription for you. Um, and then I try to do without stress. <laughs> now I'm wondering why I let Don sit on the front row uh, in front of me here. Also, why in the world am I doing this over the next two days if I don't want any stress? Um, but I'm supposed to try to minimize stress as best I can. And so that is my new normal. But what that new normal does for me, it makes me, before I do take on a project, like even the project to get ready for this class, I ask myself, what will the lasting legacy of this be? Is this important or not? Is this going to benefit the kingdom of, of God or not? 
and keeps me from getting drawn into projects. It's kind of the kind of guy that has a hard time saying no to things. And um, honestly, because of just simply, sim just simply because of my, my education and years in with school and years in the ministry, I get asked to, to take part in certain things um, because of studying Greek and that kind of stuff. And it's very hard for me to say no, but now I have to look and I have to say, okay, what is the lasting benefit of this going to be? And is it really gonna be worth the stress and the time and the effort that goes into this? Which I should have been asking all along, but I needed to wake up to be able to, to see that no, I, I, need to, I need to ask that question. And that is the new normal in my life right now. And what I would, you know, the, the stroke, it was extremely scary. It was very sobering. I mean, the most sobering thing was um, one day when um, Lee was there, and Rob and Chelsea were there, they were in the room with me. A lady came in um, and she, she looked at me and she said, I am your nurse, I am, so she said, I am your stroke coordinator. And I said, really? She said, yes. And I said, that's a thing. <laughs> and she said, yes. Um, I said, well, you're a few days late because I had the stroke. And it was nice if we could, could, could have coordinated before that it actually happened. Um, it, it, she just laughed and she said, no, I'm, I'm here basically to read you the riot act so that this doesn't happen again. Because now that it's happened once, you're in a much higher percentile of it occurring again. And I was like, oh, this just got serious right, right here. And um, she sat down and she read me the riot act in front of my wife and my daughter and even Rob, you know. You know? <laughs> and, um, but it was good for me. I needed to hear from her um, because I needed that wake up call and I needed to be able to picture uh, the new normal in my life. But I think that's, those are the kind of choices that we need to, all of us, we need to look and see that we have choices every day in our life of what are we going to do and is this going to have lasting benefit? Is this gonna be a part of our spiritual legacy for good and bad? We need to check those things out and we need to look at them. When this widow was standing there in front of the treasury, she had the choice at that moment to give nothing, to give 50%, or to give it all. And her spiritual legacy is built on the fact that she made a godly decision at that point just to give everything that she had, the entirety of what she had to live on, and left an example for all of us to, to think about because of that. Um, you know, in, it says here, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put into the treasury more than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, everything she had to live on, the entirety that she had to live on. Could you insert your name there? Instead of it saying poor widow, could you insert your name? Instead of she, out of her poverty, put in everything, could you insert your name there? One of the things that I learned when I look at this lesson um, is that Jesus saw her. Jesus is watching. I think sometimes because we are so distant from the New Testament times and distant from Jesus walking on the earth, we forget that he really is watching. Amen. And he was right there in that scene at the temple looking out and he saw her, but he's still watching. Amen. He's watching us. We need to acknowledge his presence, the presence of Jesus 24 hours a day. And the fact that Jesus is watching, even when I say that, Jesus is watching you. Do you find that comforting? Or do you find that incredibly intimidating? Because if you find it comforting, it's probably comforting because your thought is, I, I really want Jesus to watch me. I'm doing, I'm doing okay here. And I want him to be with me every minute of the day. If you find it intimidating, it's probably because you're yeah. <laughs> doing some things that you don't want brought into the light. And I think it's a good thing for us to look at that and see that. There was um, there was a, a monk, a mystic, named um, 
Brother Lawrence. And he wrote a little book called The Practice, Practicing the Presence of God. It's an excellent little book. You probably should try to buy it in an updated um, English because um, you can buy it in a very archaic English. makes it hard to read. But um, Brother Lawrence was living in a monastery, and he just decided that he was going to do his best every moment of every day to recognize that God was present there with him. And that was his practice. That was his practice. And he didn't do any, any grand things. In fact, Brother Lawrence, the main thing that he did was he worked in the kitchen. He, he swept, he peeled potatoes, and then he would go to Vespers and he would say his prayers and that sort of thing. But that was his job. Um, but as he was peeling potatoes, his thought was, I am peeling potatoes in the presence of God. Yeah. And I'm going to honor him with each swipe. As he was sweeping the floor of the kitchen, his thought was, I am doing this in the presence of God, and I'm going to honor him with what I'm doing. And I think it's just a beautiful thought to picture ourselves walking in the presence of God, because the fact is, we are. Jesus does see us. Jesus does notice. There was another, actually 20th century mystic named Frank Lombong, um, and he wrote a book called Letters from a Modern Mystic. And Lombon's thing was prayer. He prayed all the time. He really believed that prayer without ceasing meant prayer without ceasing. But it didn't have to be bowing his head and folding his hands. It could just be looking up and noticing things and saying, God bless them. Or Jesus be with me now. Or Jesus be present now. God help me now. Those kinds of things. But he practiced that all day long. And he began by starting at the top of every hour. He would stop whatever he was doing at the top of every hour and he would just take a moment, a minute. He would take one minute and he would give it to Jesus and just meditate on Jesus for one minute. And once he got used to doing that, that became a habit for him. He started doing it every top of the hour and every bottom of the hour. So every 12 o'clock and every 1230, he would stop and he would give Jesus a minute, stop and meditate and give Jesus a minute. And then once that became a habit for him, he started doing it every quarter of the hour. So at 12, 12, 15, 12, 30, quarter till, he would stop and he would give Jesus a minute. And he kept doing that until as best he could, every minute out of the hour, he would say the name of Jesus to himself. Every minute of every hour. <coughs> and that became his practice. And you think, well, that's impossible. <laughs> especially with the people I work with. You just don't understand. That is totally impossible. And I get it. Um, he lived a different kind of life. But the idea of stopping every hour to give Jesus praise, that's probably doable for most of us. And then once that becomes habit, then we try every hour and every half hour. The idea is not to be legalistic about how to do it or when to do it or what moment of the hour. The idea is to practice the presence of God throughout the day. The idea is to know that Jesus is watching, and therefore we're going to honor him throughout the day. Um, I want to just close with this thought. Actually, I was working on this lesson. I've been working on it forever. Um, but yesterday I had this thought. And let me just, let me just say this, okay? I, I do a lot of Bible study. I do. That's what I love to do. I study the Bible a lot. And when I study the Bible, I dig deep into the text. And I actually look at the Greek and the Hebrew, and um, I look at the background, and I look at commentaries, and I look at words and word order, and I try to, um, try to define the words. And I look at the concepts, and I outline. And there's a lot of things that go into good Bible study. And that's where, that's where you begin. Okay, you begin with just doing the work, just getting in and doing the work, just digging into the text. And honestly, that's, oh man, that's probably what I love to do more than anything in life. I just love to dig into the text and learn new things from the text. And the great thing is the Bible, I've never been to the Bible and felt like, ah, oh, this is old, this is boring, I've learned it all. It's just, every time I'm in there, I'm like, ah, oh, this is awesome, there's something new right there. But then something, once you've done all of that, the, uh, the last thing that you can do, and honestly, it's after you've done all that, then you can use your imagination. And that's what I started doing yesterday. Now, I would, here's the warning. 
My warning is, don't start with your imagination. <laughs> and then get into the text. Because that can take you all kinds of crazy places. Okay, so you don't start with the imagination. But it's good to end the, with the imagination. It's also good to end with just a simple little question. So what? After you've had your Bible study, you just say to yourself, okay, so what? I've studied these words, I've learned this, I've seen that, what am I gonna do with it? And so, that and the imagination. So I was thinking about this, I was thinking about what if after this story, because the story ends there, Jesus notices her, he calls the disciples over, he tells them about her, the story end, ends there. But what if the story didn't end there? What if the story continued with Jesus going out now and finding that widow and talking to her? and telling her, you know what? I saw what you did there. You gave everything, didn't you? And she's like, yes, I gave my all. And he says to her, come follow me, because the kingdom of heaven is yours. Because in Luke, his beatitude in Luke is, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You just gave your all. You have nothing left to live on. Come follow me. Be a part of my ministry. Be a part of these women that work along with me because you are a part of the kingdom of heaven. That's what I imagine happening next. Why? Why can I imagine that? Because it's what should be happening with each of us in our lives every day. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand and we will take a little break. We'll come back for our next class.